Okay, so um, welcome all to uh, Shamata Focus today. Um, so, this is Lisa. She's okay. Oh, she did say that um, there's the potential of losing power based on the, the weather front that she's experiencing. Um, so hopefully she'll, she'll come back. Yeah. Um, so in the meantime, we have uh, focusing on, on Shamata uh, today. Um, so that is the, um, and I think Rochelle, uh, uh, might've been last week or the week before, you know, it was just kind of, uh, uh, tossing around the different, um, terminology. Um, and, uh, so you were asking a little bit about shamatha. So I figured, well, let's, let's go back and do, um, a, a shamatha primer again. Um, so for most people, this would be a review. Uh, but um, maybe there might be some new material here. So let's get into it. <clears throat> okay, so uh, shamatha is the stabilizing concentration. That's what we're, we're going to be focusing on today. So shamatha uh, sometimes is referred to as the calming or cooling aspect of mind that we, we develop in practice. Um, oftentimes it's counterbalanced with, with vipassana, in terms of the um, you know, cultivating uh, the mind towards uh, awakening. So Vipassana, of course, is the seeing through, um, the illusory components of our experience and uh, disidentifying from a lot of the um, hindrances and uh, um, uh, uh, false perceptions and uh, sankharas. And then the shamatha is the calming, cooling aspect. So, you know, we contact some content and then okay how's it that we can rest into it to uh, less of a place of reactivity so um calming cooling aspect of mind uh there's one phrase within the classical definitions that i like that i really grabbed onto uh, as if resolving an issue uh, so um, when we have an issue there's a unpleasant agitating quality that's going on we cannot rest until the issue is resolved you know so when we are meditating and it's like, okay, I'm hanging out with the breath and then a thought comes up and it's like, oh, but this is important. I have to deal with this thought. Let's put the meditation on hold and I'm just going to start going into this thinking. Well, there's this urgency quality that's there. That's like, oh, okay, put the meditation aside. And of course, it's not that urgent, uh, really, um, in order for us to, you know, if we're practicing calming down. An urgency comes up, of course, that's the pattern, but you know, part of what we're being asked to do is put that urgency to the, to the side um, and work towards building a calming, cooling effect of mind. So that's the opposite of the sense of urgency that uh, one might find as a response to stimuli in practice in life. So you know, I'm cruising along, I'm meditating, I'm hanging out with the breath, everything is fine. Oh, there's a pain in my hip, my leg is falling asleep, you know, urgent. Oh, there's an itch on my nose, urgent. There's all of these driver sensations that can come off also in the body that have an urgency. I have to scratch this. I have to move. So um, it's one of the reasons why I am a big um, advocate of maintaining stillness in practice. Uh, the, because when we go to practice and, you know, some practice center cultures and teachers are like, oh, just... Be easy and compassionate towards yourself. If you have to move, move. If you scratch, do that. Let's make it easy for you. The downside of that is you're robbing one of the um, opportunity to really investigate that sense of urgency and being able to quell that or quantize that. Um, if one can actually develop that skill, I think that's the more compassionate act because then we have a skill we can take um, in life to really uh, address reducing the reactivity that's within our, our suffering. So the classical approach to developing shamatha, steadying the mind on an object to cultivate access concentration. So um, a lot of the, the meditation practices that people are uh, initially introduced to uh, in a range of different meditation cultures and schools of Buddhism, etc., we could argue are probably very shamatha based. Uh, how is it that we can just steady the mind? You know, the mind is going in a million different directions all throughout the day. How is it that we can uh, cultivate a sense of stillness, steadying the mind, recollecting the mind? 
Uh, and so uh, one of the simpler ways to do that is if we can have a steady object, steady the mind on that object and maintain the connection. Of course, the mind is gonna wanna flip away into things. So of course, uh, bring your attention back to the breath. That's why we hear this like a million times in all the meditation centers. But the more that we can maintain our, our, our contact of our attention onto a given object and maintain that, keep that steady, uh, then ultimately what will arise is access concentration. Uh, the ability to just sit down and meditate and have concentration, the faculty of concentration just turn on. Um, we'll have our ability to rest our attention on uh, whatever facet of our uh, experience that we deem relevant to the exclusion of what is irrelevant for as long as we wish. Uh, once that is developed, um, boy, your meditation can really go into uh, next level um, in terms of fueling uh, jhana practices, metta practices, vipassana practices. So it's a very, very core uh, skill set. Um, so for those of, uh, of you who are uh, in the Shenzhen background, you know, CC and E, concentration, clarity, and equanimity, concentration being one of the you know three pillars there. Uh, so this is why we're just building, focusing on that. So uh, increase the amount of time you can continuously be with the breath. Um, you know, paying attention to the calming and pleasant aspects of breath. Yeah, so that's part of what makes something a shamatha practice is if we can lean into the calming, cooling, the pleasant aspects. Um, uh, in the third tetrad of the Anapanasati uh, practice or the 16 exercises, it kind of correlates a little bit with um, some of the instructions in Chitta Anupasana, looking for the, the gladdening and balancing factors. Yeah, so breath can have a gladdening factor on that first half of breath, the inhale, then a balancing kind of cooling on that exhale factor. So depending on what your mind needs, if your mind is sluggish and kind of drifting, then focusing on the first half of the breath, that's more of a gladdening, energizing effect. If your mind is very grippy and, um, uh, uh, um, you know, anxious, you know, focusing on that second half of the breath. Uh, that balances out, cools out, or induces the relaxation response. So qualities of in and out, but also the transitions. The transitions between the breath is very important to look at too. So a lot of you have seen this before. I wasn't able to shrink this <laughs> accordingly to fit on the screen. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, so again, this is review for a lot of you. So this circle represents the breath, the cycle of breath. Uh, the, it's broken down into, we can see these two different types of gray. So this top one, this says energize. So that relates to this first half of the breath, the in-breath and the top of the in-breath. Yeah. So we're paying attention to the in and out-breath, but also the transitions between. What are the pleasant qualities? Uh, on the in-breath, most or a lot of people report there's a certain energy that's available, certain potential joyful quality that's available, the oxygen pleasure of our air needs being met. So can we lean into the pleasant qualities of the in-breath? As we transition, we come to the slowing down of the top of the in-breath and to phasing into the out-breath. Well, what are the pleasant qualities there? A lot of people report there's a, a wakefulness, a particular other type of energetic component that's there as well, a sense of fullness that happens. And when we move into the out-breath, um, you know, and the base of the out breath, there's the calming qualities. So can we lean into the relaxation response, the rest, the relinquishment uh, that is available there? Um, and then when we come to the base of the out breath, um, you know, qualities of tranquility, equanimity, peace. So regardless of what stage of the breath that you are in contact with, um, there is something pleasant or balancing out. Can we lean into those qualities? So that, that way it keeps the breath ever fresh uh, or keeps the, the um, shamatha inducing qualities ever new as they're entering into our experience. So um, although practicing uh, sustaining concentration, uh, we should not be overly striving or overly efforting. Yeah. This should be a pleasant experience. So it should feel good, plain and simple. Whatever feels good uh, that becomes available from this contact with breath, um, that should become prioritized. So um, 
I'm talking about leaning into the pleasant, the feel good, the, the relaxation response, but you know, one size does not fit all. Uh, uh, in, in Buddhism, there's um, largely a, a recognition that there are certain personality types that incline or, or that map onto the, the classical hindrances. Uh, so it means that within all of us, we may, uh, our primary hindrance is a default setting. Yeah? So <clears throat> craving, aversion, unconscious, restlessness, and doubt. Yeah? Those are the five classical hindrances. Uh, craving aversion. Sometimes people say, you know, sloth and torpor or lethargy. I like to also just talk about just the going unconscious because that broadens our um, types of ways that we just check out from our experience. So if we're a craving type, we're very much uh, pleasure based, seeking pleasure. Um, there's a lot of uh, joyfulness, but it can also be our downfall too, that we're always kind of seeking out the pleasure. So for the craving type of personality, if you identify as that, then contact the pleasurable aspects. Um, it's probably easier for you to find the pleasurable aspects in breath. Uh, find to become engaged with pleasure associated with breath. Now then, uh, if you are an aversive type like me, that means to say, given whatever uh, life presents you in the given moment, aversion is your first primary go-to uh, response. Uh, well, maybe focusing on pleasure is not that available or um, interesting. So it's more about focusing away from the displeasure and towards just the stillness and stability qualities. You know, can, can you rest into any of the stabilizing features that can come from breath? Maybe that's more the focus uh, if you're an aversive type. If you're an unconscious type, that means uh, someone who's prone to spacing out, phasing out, just losing contact. Um, that could also be a little bit of maybe a dissociative type as well, um, where we just kind of lose contact and just phase off. Um, well, it's all about, can we reinforce the maintaining of contact? So maybe labeling sets work. So a lot of my um, meditation practices I do, um, you know, I introduce a labeling set. So that helps. So maybe it's about labeling the sensations related to the points of the cycle of breath. Yeah. So on the in-breath, what's available for to you? Maybe it's just the joy. Maybe on the in-breath, it's just the wakeful quality. On the out-breath, rest and the base of the out-breath, peace. So maybe as you're going through the cycle of breath, you just might um, label what's the primary quality that you're contacting. So inhale, you know, wakeful or joy. Top of the in-breath, label wakeful. Out breath, rest, basically out breath, peace. And so as you're breathing, you're just labeling joy, wakeful, rest, peace, joy, wakeful, rest, peace. Yeah, and so on like that. Or whatever it is that is salient and true for you. Uh, so the labeling helps to sustain the continuity of mindfulness. If you identify as a restless, anxious, uh, hindrance personality, uh, focusing on the calming, the soothing, uh, and away from the restlessness. So I'm not saying restlessness will magically go away, but can you deprioritize the restlessness and seek for any of the calming, soothing qualities that may be available? Lean into that. And if you're the doubt type, uh, where it's just, I'm doing it wrong, this must be wrong, this must be a horror, you know, totally forget it, I'm just going to throw in the towel, you know, if that's your um, orientation, persistence, persistence in the face of doubt. Uh, trust, sadha. Sadha is the quality of trust or faith, but it's also kind of a, a learned trust in a way. You know, uh, the more that I put some energy and effort into the practice and I yield, get back a, a particular positive result, then that builds a little bit more of a faith trust there. Yeah? So this is part of the building of sadha. A lot of it is the persistence, virya, energy. Um, so trust that you're doing it right, even though all of the systems are saying failure, failure, you know, just keep persisting in doing it. Persist in the technique, uh, reprioritizing for the message of doubt as sankaric activity, meaning rather than doubt message comes up and say, oh, well, I have to listen to this. Doubt means I'm clearly doing it wrong. I should stop. Just recognize, oh, of course, doubt is going to show up. This is just the pattern. Okay, pattern, can you just hang out in the back seat? I'm just going to do this anyway, even though you're saying I'm doing it wrong. Yeah. So, 
um, craving, aversion, unconscious, restlessness, doubt, different ways that we can maybe uh, alter uh, the relationship with the simple contact with breath. And all in all, time is your friend. Persistence, uh, persistence uh, uh, of um, uh, effort over time will yield results. Starting over is your friend. Um, being willing to pick up from the beginning and rebuild over and over and over. Um, if we can open up to that uh, as not just a sign of failure, but just as this is how it is, uh, because even decades down the line into the practice, we need to be able to be willing to pick up and start over again. Okay. So I was originally not going to uh, say much at all, but uh, there it is. <laughs> Before we get into the sit, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, Michelle. And just to clarify, I think it was pretty evident that, that um, the top in out um, base is that literally starting at the top. I'm not sure if it goes around or. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, that's just a, a diagram I meant, uh, a diagram I created, uh, just visualizing, uh, if we were to visualize the breath as a circle. Um, uh, the top is literally the top of the in-breath. When we're inhaling all the way to the top uh, of peak oxygen intake, and then, you know, we start to go down into the out-breath, breathing out, and then ah, the bottom is like, all right, we're at the base of the out-breath. We've breathed out. We're at the end of the out-breath, that pause before we start to breathe in again. Then we're on the in-breath. Then we've breathed in fully. We're at the top of the in-breath. We're breathing out. We're going down. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of what I was attempting to depict. So it doesn't matter where you enter in, it's just wherever you're at in your, uh, in your breathing. Yeah. Did, did, is, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't sure if it, there was a directionality to it exactly. So, I mean, clearly you start with the in-breath, but mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if you then go up to the top or you start at the top. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's just a way. I don't know how to breathe, obviously. Uh, yeah, <laughs> breath, it, it, you know, as soon as you start looking at it, it gets quite challenging. All right, cool. Okay, good. So allow yourself to come to a comfortable upright position. Now you just have to straighten up and settle in. I'm going to be working with the uh, Shamata focus today. So we can initiate and sustain simple contact with breath. So classically, I invite you to bring your attention to a part of the body that is actively engaged in breathing. Be that the nose, throat, lungs, or belly. and anchor your attention here.
and begin to notice the pleasant and restful qualities of breath that's available to you on that in-breath. What's available to you at the top of the in-breath as you are inhaling and coming to that pause, transitioning to the out-breath, what's available there? So available on that out breath. And what is available on the base of the out-breath? When you've breathed out, coming towards that pause before breathing in again. So thinking will be happening, that's a given. It's almost like two activities occurring. Can you just let the thinking be in the background and continue to reaffirm your conscious connection with the breath? The more the breath becomes interesting, the less thinking becomes interesting. The more that you can lean into the pleasant and restful qualities of breath, the less appealing and entertaining the thoughts are.
So part of making this experience interesting, opening up to the newness, the freshness of the breath in each moment, is discovering what potentially pleasant qualities are arising. So one option is to lean into the pleasurable, the feel good aspect of the breath and kind of the splash ripple effect. The pebble splashes into the pond, and then the ripples slowly move out towards the edges of the pond. So we may have more of an acute contact with the breath of the part of the body that we're anchored towards. But having this peripheral awareness that moves towards the outside, the edges of the body, where we're observing any of these pleasant qualities rippling, moving, or arising within the body itself. Another option is to lean into the steadying, stabilizing qualities. Focusing away from any discontent or displeasure present right now. Leaning the attention into whatever feels stable, settled, resolved.
If you're feeling rather unconscious or drifting, you can use a labeling set. What are the salient qualities that you contact on the in-breath, top of the in-breath, out-breath, and base of the out-breath? Just reduce it down to one word for each phase. Just repeat that particular word as you hit that phase. As I was modeling before, it might be as simple as joy, wakeful, rest, peace, joy, wakeful, rest, peace, and so on like that. Just reflecting what's the salient quality on each of those four phases of breath. Just repeat that word as you pass through that phase, thus reinforcing a continuous flow of mindfulness. However, if labeling does not feel appropriate, you don't have to do it. It's only a tool available if you need it.
you find yourself restless, lean into whatever are the restful qualities. Just deprioritizing any focus on restlessness, allowing that to be in the background, just like allowing thoughts to be in the background. Leaning into the calming and cooling. Leaning into or leaning away from any sense of urgency. And into the openness, spaciousness, and the cooling out. If you're coming across the hindrance of doubt, just continue to persist. Continue to endure. Continue to carry on in the face of. Be willing to start over again and again. Pick up where you left off and rebuild.
Okay, at ease. Allowing yourself to still receive uh, the merits of your practice. What did you notice? What did you observe? What was relevant in your practice this morning? Feel free to unmute yourself and manifest. I don't have my, can you hear me okay? I don't have my earphones on. Yeah, you're a little quiet, but I can hear you. I can try to talk a little bit closer to the laptop. <laughs> um, I, I felt like I really, there was a lot of effort in my, um, especially in the inhale this morning. And um, I'm usually on the hindrances, I would say, I'm usually more number one, the craving type. So I was kind of trying to work with the prompts that you'd given us for the craving type. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I wasn't finding energy in the inhale at all. I was, just felt like a, a lot of effort. The yeah. exhale, I felt, the exhale actually was restful and the surrender word came to my mind. Um, but um, I'm not, I didn't eat breakfast really, but I felt, it was almost like I felt full, like I was too full and it was just like a lot of effort to take in the breath. And mm -hmm. um, so for, after a while, after kind of struggling with that and not really finding any kind of rhythm with it for probably 10 minutes, I went to Sloth and Topur and just, cause that's was really, I think more what I was feeling. Um, but I couldn't remember the prompts that you said to use for sloth and topor. So it did, I, I just was labeling it that sloth and topor. Mm -hmm. um, but the one thing that did energize me, there's a tiny breeze in my room right now from the window and that just the feel of the breath on my skin was energizing. So it wasn't really to, anything to do with the breath. Mm -hmm. um, so I wasn't really sure as that was, you know, if it was, better to just sort of focus on that awakening quality of that sensation on my skin or to try to stay with the breath. So I started kind of going back and forth. Sure. Uh, well, you know, I think that, um, you know, th there are for many people, uh, they might find that a particular facet of the breath might not be pleasant or might be a little bit more activating. In this case, it sounded like the in breath for one reason or another was effortful and unpleasant. Um, and, uh, that's normal. I think that happens to everybody from time to time. Uh, then there's a class of people that, uh, breath is just generally unpleasant, uh, to work with at all, in which case it's good to have other, um, options and opportunities. Um, so a person doesn't necessarily have to work with the breath. Um, it's, it seems to be one of the more, um, common ways for, uh, uh cultivating, in a relationship with that object just because it's so readily available but um i think that i, I, I usually do the best the breath i mean i like the breath mm -hmm. usually, this was different i think today yeah it was different yeah. so the fact that there was this constant consistent breeze and that you were connecting with that and that was providing a, a sense of kind of a pleasantness and appreciation um that's great I think that's great to work with that. Um, also, I think that if the breath is not working for you in the moment, I think external sound, uh, if sound is generally more neutral to pleasant than unpleasant, then definitely work with external sound a lot. I think that that creates a nice sense of spaciousness and uh, can be settling. Um, so yeah, if, if breath is not working or faster the breath is not working, then you can definitely, um, open up this peripheral awareness into like other attributes of your environment that may uh, provide a sense of restfulness or, or uh, pleasant uh, pleasantness in its contact. So that's, that's, that's fine. That's good that you're able to do that. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. So yeah, for the, the, the sloth and torpor, were, you know, I was putting it as unconscious, you know, the prompt for that was labeling. Um, and it seems like, like you worked with that labeling set, um, which is great. Um, you know, what, I, uh, I think that the example that I gave was just, you know, noticing what are the pleasant qualities in the four stages and just using that as a labeling set. Ultimately, um, the labeling set 
matters less than what it is that you're actually in contact with. Um, so, um, you know, if you, as long as you're maintaining a sustained contact with something and being able to, you know, cultivate a restful quality into that, um, that's good. So it sounds like you're able to adapt accordingly to what was true for you this morning, Susan. Yeah. Yeah. I think even when I, when I, I, I even right now feeling kind of that breeze, then when I go back to the breath, the breath is more calming. <laughs> but maybe I was just putting too much effort into it. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. Thanks. Sure. Definitely. So we notice that when we like effort or strive a little too much, how it can become a little um, unpleasant. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Liz. Uh, Susan. All right. Anyone else? We can have time for one last one, and then we can wrap up. Yeah, Rochelle. I guess I was just going to say I really enjoyed, um, you know how sometimes I think most of us at one time or another think we're doing it wrong. The whole meditation, whatever it is, it's like, I don't get it. I'm not doing it right, et cetera, et cetera. And there was a point in today's meditation when um, I had decided, you know what, I'm going to simplify. I'm just going to pick one of those labels for the in and one for the out. And actually, that's all I did. I didn't even do the top and the, and the bottom, which I never quite saw the bottom clearly. But I went with oxygen pleasure because I'm kind of intrigued by that. I'm not sure I get it. And relinquish because to me, you know, letting go can also be an issue just in general. And right after I had decided and kind of implemented that, you said something about you can just pick one, you know, you said, I think joy and rest or whatever you said. And I was like, wow, I got it right. <laughs> you know? But it, I just, I enjoyed those. Um, I enjoyed that chart a lot. So thanks for that. Okay, good. Glad that worked for you. And and yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer of people just naturally having an inherent wisdom about how to, you know, a adapt uh, these prompts to what's true and, and relevant and needed in their own experience. So yeah, just because you mentioned the doubt factor. So yeah, just go with it. Go with the, um, go with and, and begin to trust in your inner wisdom there. Okay. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, we've reached the top of the hour, so I'll release everybody back to the wilds. Uh, so life practice, can you, as you go through the day, um, maintain contact uh, with some semblance of breath or some semblance of a calming, um, pleasurable aspect of breath? And how might that begin to influence how you show up in your work or in your interpersonal uh, communication? Um, now it's all about being able to thread these experiences from the cushion to off the cushion as well. Um, so that's the homework. And we'll check in on that tomorrow. Okay, let's do a, a dedication of merit by the merits of these acts and other such virtues. May we obtain liberation for the benefit of all beings. We bow before those who come before us on the path and after us on the path. Thank you, everybody. See you all manana.